Yes, hello and welcome to all our West Australian football fans to another edition of Around the Waffle. We are into round 13. We're hot off the heels of another exciting round 12 of football and we're going to review it all for you today here on Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. Watching live on the Back Chat YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcast. Paul Persick with you in the Back Chat studios and I'm joined by a man who was overtaken once Ned Kelly is the world's most greatest beard, Will Schofield, he joins me here today. Hello, Will. Hello, Paul. Look, I'd like to know who's running those ranking systems, mate, but I'm happy you're pleased with my beard, mate. I'm very happy. Good to be with you. How are you? Going very well. It's another big weekend of footy that uh, we're going to review today. It is. I'm um, looking forward to getting through a bit of the stuff. Look, there's the ups, there's the downs, clearly West Coast on the downside of things, but Got a very special guest today that'll be uh, coming from the upside of things, top of the table, Claremont. Absolutely. Zach Mainwaring, the son of a champion, he'll be uh, joining us in just a moment. And just before we do, uh, we have uh, some big information for Waffle women's fans as well. The preliminary final isn't too far away. It'll be this Sunday afternoon at Fremantle Oval at 3.15 between the two arch rivals, South Fremantle and East Fremantle, to see who will take on Claremont in July 15's grand final. You can get your tickets from the Waffle website or you can get them at the gate. What a game it is going to be. Now, just before we have Zach Mainwaring on to join us, Scoey, a big story that uh, hit last night. West Perth, the reigning premiers, they will have a new coach. Right. Darren Harris, he's uh, out. He will leave the club as part of the succession plan. And uh, Jason Salasic, who's been in the reserves uh, side as their coach, he's going to be in. So Darren Harris was a coach at West Coast when I first got there in 2006. Uh, premiership coach uh, as an assistant uh, to the... I think midfield. No, he's a forward coach. Someone was the forward, mid, uh, midfield coach. Yep. Great coach, great bloke. Uh, premiership coach now, of course. Uh, so, look, I didn't know that, but that's that's some news, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And Jason Salasic, what he has done, he's really impressed the club. It was, it was a recent presentation that he made to the board uh, to see who would get the job uh, as part of the succession plan, and Salasic happened to get it. So congratulations to Jace, and, uh, you know, we wish him all the very best. Yeah, that'll be good. I mean, Darren's been... Uh, a long-time coach of both West Perth, West Coast, uh, clearly experienced man. So I'm sure, like some in some time, they'll be able to you know hand over that team properly. Um, West Perth, you know, were they are they stoked where they are right now? I mean, they're just sitting outside of the five. Uh, the succession plan doesn't work. We've seen it at AFL level. Um, I guess so time will tell, but. It'll be interesting to see how we go. Absolutely. We do wish uh, Harrow all the best for the rest of the season and uh, beyond. This is Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. All right, time for our special guest to join us. He's had a great year. First season in the league team with the Claremont Football Club. He spent a lot of time in Colts and Reserves in years before, but this season he's really made a name for himself. He's not only the son of a champion, but he's also creating his own path of greatness from the Claremont Football Club. Zach Mainwaring, he's good enough to join us here on Around the Waffle. Zach, thanks for your time, mate. No worries at all. Thanks for having me. Great pleasure to have you on the show. You've played such a real prime role in the team, about playing a handful of games this season. What's the environment like there, and what's Ashley Prescott like uh, as a coach? Yeah, no, we've got um, a real good environment down at the club at the moment with um, a fairly young side in. But, um, yeah, no, Ash, Ash is great with all us young boys and stealing uh, lots of confidence in us, um, kind of letting us play our own game, but um, still telling us to stick to the team structures um, which seems to be working for us. Matey, uh, Will Schofield here. Mate, I've watched your development over the last few years. Looks like you've taken a real step forward this year, mate. Congratulations. What's your what's your role in the team? How, how has that helped, I guess, your form personally and, and then stepping inside that team environment? Yeah, I think for the last couple of years, um, kind of my, my I, I thought I was a bit of a, a taller forward and um, more that hit up forward and and wanting to kick a fair few goals. But I think working with Ash and um, new forward coach uh, Glenn McCallum this year, it's been more uh, being that high-pressure forward, tackling and um, getting up the ground um, and telling me that uh, goals will come off the back of that. So that's been huge for me, just getting my work rate up and um, trying to use my fitness and speed to, to my advantage. Let's go to the game against Subiaco, uh, Zach, on Saturday. It was a fast start from your Tigers. Did you expect Subiaco to come back into the contest, like with your side and Subiaco being two very good sides? Yeah, we knew Subi being the side they are and um, how, how, much comf- uh, how much confidence they do have with all their success from the last couple of years that they were, they were never going to give up. So um, we knew a fast start and a good start would put us um, in good stead. And uh, luckily, yeah, we could hold on. Um, it would have been nice to 
convert a few more opportunities that probably would have put us um, a bit further ahead. But yeah, good to go out with a win. So you're sitting on top of the ladder at the moment, uh, Maney. You've got, uh, look, you've got, I feel like for as long as I can remember in the Waffle, Claremont's played the same way. You've got a great midfield, hard running, uh, handball receives from your back line. You've got, you know, several key players. What's, what do you think the key is to you blokes as a team, your success this year? Do you feel like you're changing much or are you just going about your business? Yeah, I don't think there's too much change from last year. I think there's maybe um, within the forward line, it's probably we've got a bit of a different dynamic with um, Buller going out and not being so tall. But yeah, it's still kind of just um, sticking to our structure that Ash has um, instilled in us and, and just trusting the process. Um, and this year, yeah, I think it's been working very well with, with boys just playing their role. And um, yeah, I think we've got a really um, uh, unselfish team. So um, that's just helped us with boys just playing where they're told. So no, it's real good. Looking ahead to this Saturday against South Fremantle at Fremantle Oval. Big game it certainly is going to be. You, you and the Bulldogs have had uh, some great clashes over the last uh, few years, including that 2020 grand final. Uh, what will the preparations be like heading into that big game? Yeah, we know we know um, Bulldogs are a, a very proud team, so um, certainly not going to be an easy one. So I think yeah, just our preparation will be kind of yeah, suiting our um, sticking to our game plan and making sure we're doing all the right things, um, trusting everyone in the team. And I think uh, yeah, we can come out with the win if we do that. But yeah, we know we um, certainly can't go out there thinking um, it's going to be a walkover because it's certainly not. Dogs at do- uh, at their home ground are a very tough side to beat. Maney, um Jack Buller, you mentioned him just before. You must be proud as a teammate seeing him uh, get picked up, move to Sydney, playing his first AFL game. What's that like as, as, a, as a waffle teammate seeing someone get picked up in that mid-season draft? Yeah, l- luckily for me, I, I was fairly close to the big bull um, before he, he got drafted. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's great to see him um, get that success. He, um, he had the chances earlier on in his um, career playing state and whatnot and unfortunately didn't get there but it's good to see him work at it and, and stick at it and start playing some real good footy and as you can see he's, um, he's a pretty special talent and um, yeah he's killing it over there so stoked for him. Zach congrats on a, on a great win against Subiaco on Saturday and a great season so far on your own part. All the very best for Saturday against South Fremantle. Thanks for your time Zach. Thank you very much. That was Zach Mainwaring, of course, from the Claremont Football Club. The uh, not only the son of the late great Chris Mainwaring, but also carving out his own uh, brilliant path. In speaks uh, speaks well, the young fellow. As he as he um, said, they're they're a young side, Claremont. They, they've got some obviously some senior guys running around there still, uh, Jai Bolton and, and Co. But um, uh, like you can tell that they're a close group. Um, that Jack Buller stuff's interesting because you hear a lot from club level, um, you know, in the state leagues that it's a really difficult thing to be able to cover someone like Jack Buller, and clearly. You know, they've continued on their path without him in there. Um, but you've got to also think about the personal relationships these guys have. So, Zach so Mainwaring, it sounds like he's good mates with Jack Bully. His mate gets an opportunity to go and play in the AFL. Um, it's, you know, I, I think I think it's a great thing. And I, I know it's not, not the best thing for state league footy, but in the end, these kids want to play AFL. So... Um, it's good to hear, good to see him playing some good footy and Claremont going well too. Absolutely. They look like a more closer bunch than what they were last year because obviously that grand final loss last October has really put an extra fire in the Claremont belly because they want to get that premiership. It's eluded them for 11 years and they are a much more closer unit, much more tidy unit than what they were last year. It's a difficult thing losing a grand final and coming back the next year. There's expectation that, well, okay, if you can get to the grand final, you can go one better, but it doesn't always happen that way. So what they've been able to do the start this year, it's been great, but they'll know that you know, certainly, you know, they're not all the way to a flag right now. They need to continue the season going. But they're in red-hot form, so no doubt about that. Now, every uh, Waffle game in round 13, five games this weekend, will be live, free, and in full on the AFL app. If you're not able to make to any of the games, make sure you tune in. It's going to be a ripper round of football, and we'll have that all previewed for you on Thursday. This is Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. Will Schofield and Paul Persick. All right, let's get into it, Scoey. Three games as part of the first part of NADOC round, where all the home teams during the round uh, wore the specially designed NADOC round jumpers with the theme Connecting Through Culture, which is fantastic. Beautiful designs too, I must say. Let's start off in Mandurah, Peel Thunder and South Fremantle. South Fremantle, they were in control for about 70% of the game, but Peel Thunder, again in the last quarter, just ripped them apart. Well, it's sort of, you wonder if it's the AFL alignment that gets the fitness going or if it's uh, just what they're doing down at Peel. I tend to think, 
that it's what happens down at Peel Thunder. Matt Rosa and Coa that are, are driving the standards down there. Um, you know, you, you look you look up the road to West Coast and what they're doing with their alignment, and you look at Peel Thunder. I think Peel Thunder is the model now. East Perth didn't like it with West Coast. Uh, didn't quite work out. West Coast go to their own team, and you've seen what the state they're in. So, the Peel Thunder Footy Club. Look, I've been there. I've played footy down there. I uh, played after my AFL career. I think the way that they bond between AFL and non-AFL players, uh, it's exceptional. Mm. Um, they they didn't quite get it done last year in a final against Claremont, if Claremont, I remember correct. correctly. They're looking like they're a better side this year. They've got a few, few more holes um, filled. And they're getting performances out of those AFL listed players. Look, you can say what you like in, in the state league. It is how it is, and, and they're gonna want their AFL listed players playing well. And it looks like they are at the moment. But also their locals, their their peel local players also are playing well. I mean, if from the Dockers' point of view, you talk about the likes of Will Brody who had another twenty possessions also, and uh, and the local players as well. Jacob Blight who was sensational at down back, and Bailey Banfield who was all around the ground, and he may poll in the Player of the Year votes, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Well, Blair Carl Warner Blair, was sensational Blair, as well. Blair Bell um, is one of those local guys that. Um, he, look, he's really transitioned his game from that key forward into a midfield role, and um, you know knew him as a teammate, um, outstanding leader, um, stands up when the game gets hard. Uh, ben Hancock's been a really good player for a long time in the Waffle, and continues doing that as captain. So, um, look, I, I, think, uh, I think I've got really big hopes for Peel Thunder this year. I would say I'm a Peel Thunder guy. Um, if we're picking teams, yeah. no, you're a West Perth man. <laughs> uh, Peel Thunder's my team, and it's good to see them get over at, um, South Fremantle in a close well, one. Well, they keep their hopes of the double chance alive. As for South Fremantle, it's the, it's these habits of goalless final quarters that is really getting the better of them. When you look at round nine against West Perth, they leaped by some 30 points at one stage in round nine. They didn't score a goal. We look what happened again over the weekend against Peel Thunder. They're just not playing that four-quarter game. I had those same worries a couple of years ago about West Perth, and even with the likes of Tom Bletcherton in form, 33 disposals, Jake Florenka with 24, and Zach Strom with another two goals, there's just another piece of the puzzle missing. It's easy to say that, that with the four mature players that they have lost at the end of last season, but they've still got some experience there, and it's not firing at the moment for South Fremantle. No, it's not. Um, but, but I, I would probably come back to the fact that they're playing against a good side, Paul. So they started behind the eight ball, didn't they, this year, um, given where they came from, um, from a points perspective, and they sit well outside the top five. But... Um, Look, they'll have things they want to work on during the year. It didn't work for them here, but you'd want to be in games anyway. They're, they're at least in the game, I think, from a positive point of view, yes. but they're going to have to improve to make finals this year. Absolutely, and, and the problem is they've got Claremont next, and that's where we're going to go to, Claremont and Subiaco at Revo Fitness Stadium. And they survived a late charge from the Lions, and they ultimately got home by seven points, and they stand alone atop of the pops, top the ladder. That is right. Uh, you'd have to say they're premiership favourites at this point oh, in yeah. time. Um, Jai Bolton, 25 disposals. Our man... Uh, uh, is that main Zach Mainwaring? Zach kicks two goals, three... Um, They've got they've got areas that they want to improve on. Clearly, um, I like Eastland's work in the ruck as well. He has thirty four uh, hit outs. That was a huge battle, Eastland yep. and Clark, and I think Eastland just got Clark on this occasion. Well, Clark, you'd have to say Clark's gone close to the best ruckman in the comp this year. Oh yeah, absolutely, no doubt about it. He's continuously averaging some thirty to forty hit outs per game, and I reckon he'd be a favourite, one of the favourites of the Sandover Medal come September. Yeah, Cal England, of course, spent time on uh, the West Coast Eagles list. He's been impressive this year. He doesn't kick a goal, but his 20 touches, it, you know, hey, Cal, you're not Toby Green, but he's a Toby Green type player where he can get his touches. Once he has them, he influences goals. Might not kick him, but always has something to do with a goal assist. So he's been an important player for him as well. Subiaco on the other side, they had their important players firing, but to be honest, it was only in the last quarter because they were around three or four goals behind for much of the game. Lee Kitchen only had 20, and he was... A little bit quiet, but his influence in the final quarter was very important. Uh, Stefan Gyro continuing his good format. Six tackles to go with his 20 touches. And uh, Liam Hickmott continuing his good season as well. Three marks, five tackles to go with his uh, 20 touches. Oh, I like, only... I like Hickmott. Yeah, I Hickmott's really great. like him. He was fantastic in the grand final last year. Close to best on ground. Um, and yeah, I really like what he's done as a football player. He's a really hard, in and under guy, but he's got the outside talent as well. Mm. 
a little bit more than his father did, unfortunately. His dad was just an inside drunk player. Um, I'd say Hitmont's a better player than his old man. <laughs> no, I'll take your word on that. Uh, now it was a great win for Claremont over uh, Subiaco and uh, very, very even in a lot of the areas, with exception for the accuracy. Claremont just got to work on their accuracy in front of goal, 10-14 to 10-7. Not a pleasant figure, but at least they uh, get the four points all the same and they stand alone atop the ladder. The third game, Scoey, and uh, dare I say it, the less said about it, the better. East from Andal at the Wacker. 3317 215 West Coast 4731 I don't know what's a better double ton Steve Smith and the Ashes or uh, East Fremantle uh, just on Saturday Well we haven't seen the double ton from Smith, Steve Smith this year have we I was meaning in the 2017 okay. 18 Ashes Very good I was like I thought I'd been watching the Ashes the entire <laughs> time Look I, I think we can speak about it a little bit I'm not going to break down the game clearly it's an absolute bloodbath but um, what I said about Peel Thunder the alignment model with the Waffle team, I think that's what's got to happen for the West Coast Eagles. Um, clearly, uh, right now, with the injuries they have, and they're not going to have that every year, yeah. but, but I do think even with a full list of players, I think it's a really difficult model to maintain for the West Coast Eagles. Um, they've, they've effectively got to run two football clubs to have it run properly. Uh, they've got to be able to acquire players from zones that they don't have, and that's all understandable. It's something that the West Coast Eagles wanted. This wasn't something that the Waffle uh, pushed. It's what West Coast wanted. I don't think it's worked. And I think, you know, at times, whether it's an alignment model or if it's a game plan or if it's, you know, whatever it is, you've got to be able to put your hand up and say, look, it's not working and this isn't working. What will it take for it to work in the long term if West Coast want it to work? Well, I think they've got to merge with a team. I think they've got to merge with another Waffle side and that looks like Perth to me. So... Look, that might not be agreed upon by by others, but I, that's what I think is going to happen. Um, it's going to happen from Perth's point of view that they, they haven't played, they haven't won a final in a long time. Um, they haven't been a successful side over the you know modern day history, and I think for them to do it, I think it makes complete sense to merge with a with a West Coast side, and it brings everything into line. I think it evens out the competition, uh, uh, the integrity issues that it's been spoken about. I think they get alleviated at some point uh, if you do do that. So. Look, the West Coast Eagles are going to want to do that, and so do Perth, but I think that's the smartest model right now. Fans, get involved in that. Should Perth merge with West Coast in the future, let us know uh, on our YouTube channel or on wherever you get your podcast. It will be a fascinating topic in the, in the long term. Going from the West Coast side of the coin to East from Andal side of the coin, it, it was no surprise that every player was going to contribute. Milan Murdoch back to his best form, Harrison Marsh as well. Cameron Eardley, brilliant down back and even in midfield uh, as well. Uh, Jonathan Marsh, it was great to see him back in form. Five goals. He's he's what the game really needs, like characters in that forward line. Yeah, he can be a bit of a hot head at times, but yep. when he's at his best, he can really kick big bags of goals. Five goals for him. And Cody Leggett in his 100th game, six. Well, you would have to be pretty stiff most weeks to kick five goals and be the third highest goal kicker on the ground. So, yeah, Cody Leggett, six goals, three. And O'Reilly kicked five, four. So, bad luck, Marshy. Just on the podium, mate, with five <laughs> goals straight. Well, at least he got on the podium. It's not bad. Yeah, correct. <laughs> but, uh, no, well done to East Fremantle. It was a big percentage boost for them, but uh, it was one that they needed because they've got West Perth in Joondalup coming up this weekend. That is going to be a ripper game. We'll tell, that, we'll tell our listeners more about that on Thursday. To the ladder, Scoey, after round 12. Claremont, they stand alone atop the ladder. 36 points and three teams tied on 32. It is East, uh, East Perth, Peel Thunder and Subiaco with East Fremantle two games clear of West Perth in the five. Then go the Falcons, Swan District, South Fremantle, Perth and West Coast after round 12. This is Around the Waffle, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. Will Schofield and Paul Persick. All right, Scoey, time for the Around the Waffle Player of the Year right. votes. Okay. Uh, one vote goes to Tom Bletchenden of South Fremantle. Now, this is from a losing team, but uh, Tom Bletchenden's effort in midfield, just outstanding. He's been in consistent form, racking up the disposals. He was a very important influence. Must to have goal. been very good. And he certainly is. Number t- uh, two votes. Oliver Eastland of Claremont won the ruck battle against uh, Zach Clark. Uh, his role was very important from a Claremont point of view. He did so much more around the football. He was sensational. He gets the two votes. I haven't seen these votes, so I'm glad that I mentioned him when we're doing the review. Did Cameron Eardley, uh, he got three votes, uh, 35 disposals, 10 marks, five inside 50s, and a goal. His all-round game against Brown. I, th- I think he's more than just a lockdown defender. He can play right up the middle here. He can play right up the middle and take those all-important marks to shut down every opposition entry inside Ford 50. Yeah. Rock Very solid. Good. Like it. Four votes. Anthony Davis of Claremont on the subject of uh, defenders. He held Ben Sokol so well in that game on Saturday against the Lions. Held Sokol goalless for that matter. 20 disposal, 8 marks, 4 tackles, 2 inside 50s and a goal. But this week, the Around the Waffle top gun of Round 12 
goes to Bailey Banfield of Peel Thunder. He was brilliant everywhere, all throughout the, that win over, over South Fremantle. I like these votes. There's Backman getting a lick of the ice cream. Bailey Banfield, of course, the perennial role player at Fremantle, comes back. He's always going to be one of the best players in the waffle when he comes back to that level because he's a good AFL player. So uh, very good. Peel Thunder featuring at the top of the ladder as well. 19 disposals, 9 marks, 7 tackles, 9 inside 50s as well. And uh, he also uh, got a goal for himself to boot. I don't know if you know this answer, but who's in front in this uh, tally at the moment? Well, that's where we've got the leaderboard after round 12, yeah. and we can reveal it to you right now. Jai Bolton is still in the lead yes. uh, despite fouling to poll. He's on 11. Zach Clark is just one behind on 10 along with Jarvis Pena of Swan Districts. Then rounding out the top Jarvis. Six. Yep, Jarvis. He's been sensational at the Swans this season. Uh, rounding out the top six, Milan Murdoch of East Fremantle, Tom North of East Perth with eight votes, and Bailey Banfield, he catapults into the top six. He's got five votes along with several other players. And as a matter of fact, Scoey, 46 players at the present time have polled votes in the Player of the Year. Did I get a vote? No, you didn't. Unfortunately. <laughs> no, you didn't. Because the, the Eagles got smashed. <laughs> I kicked a goal, though, mate. Yes, yeah, still. It wasn't enough. <laughs> Sorry, Scoey. <laughs> That's very good, mate. <laughs> Turn it up. But, uh, <laughs> That's good, you, mate. You've got to be in a winning side, but there is a few exceptions. Of course, Tom Bletchen and yeah, he got one. losing team. Yes. Right. No worries. Couldn't squeeze me. <laughs> and also, I might have to make another comeback for you, Paul. You'll, ha- you'll have to. It'll be the third Schofield encore. <laughs> Maybe against Perth or, or something, I don't know, because West Coast play Perth on Saturday. When do they play West Perth? I might go and play them and have 30 and kick five. Uh, a bit later in the season, but the only problem is you're up against uh, my mighty Falcons and uh, we'll do what we did back in round two. Okay. Well, I didn't play in that game, Paul, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> this is Around the Waffle, of course, the official podcast of the West Australian Football League. Will Schofield and Paul Persick. Now, just before we go, Scoey, it was another sensational weekend of football, but the, the NAIDOC round concept has been... Embraced so well by all the WAFL clubs. Not only this past weekend, we saw three of the home teams where they're specially designed NAIDOC jumpers, but the five remaining teams that are coming off the bye will do the same in round 13 with all five games, all teams coming back into action. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, my Indigenous jerseys that I had over my career with West Coast uh, hold them very dear to my heart. It was always, always my favourite round to play in. Look, yeah, the, the jumper designs are great, but a big feature of what we used to do at AFL level was... Um, you know, a lot of our a lot of our guys, our indigenous fellas, used to come up and and talk about their connection to family and to country and to to the game and how much footy means to uh, them and their families. And um, that's why I used to love playing in these rounds because it's a real feature of our game. Um, what what in you know, like what our, what our guys do, um, our indigenous fellas do. Um, there's it's something that that I just love and my, my time in the game was short but sweet and uh, my fondest mer- memories involve some of those guys. Lewis Jetta kicking that goal against Collingwood in the qualifying final. Oh, Liam Ryan and taking hangers on my head in the waffle. Um, the list goes on and so I'm looking forward to seeing the guys run out in the jumpers. And a great theme too. Talk about, of course, uh, talking about their cultures and their families as well, connecting through culture being the theme and that will continue in round 13 with all the five teams uh, that are coming back into action off the bye, playing at home and wearing their specially designed jerseys. Good. We'll have more of that when we preview round 13 on Thursday. Scoey, thanks for your time. We'll see you soon. Sounds good. See you, mate. That was another edition of Around the Waffle. We do have socials in operation, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Give us a big thumbs up. We really do appreciate it. And don't forget, this Sunday, the preliminary final of the Waffle W competition, East Fremantle taking on South Fremantle at Fremantle Oval. What a game that's going to be. You can get your tickets on the Waffle website. They'll go on sale this week. Thanks for your company. We look forward to uh, your listenership and viewership on Thursday when we preview round 13. We'll see you soon.